Thank you for joining us today on our Lessons from the Pandemic webinar discussing reengaging young people who have left school. We'll wait a minute or two for participants to join, and then I'll explain the flow of today's webinar. We do want to thank AT&T, our sponsor for this event, and a crucial partner in this work for many years. A quick logistical note while we wait. You'll notice that we have both a chat box and a Q&A box. Please input all questions related to technical support or general APA questions into the chat. We'll also have a staff member following along in this general chat to share helpful links or notes. If you have questions for presenters through or for the discussion section at the end of the webinar, please submit those using our Q&A box. So like I said, we're gonna wait a minute for people to join and then we'll get started. All right, now that people are on, I'm so excited to begin. I wanted to start off by introducing myself. My name is Liz Glazer and I'm a director on the Strategic Initiatives and Partnerships team at America's Promise Alliance. I've been working with the Grad Nation campaign since 2017 and I'm going to moderate today's conversation. Today's agenda begins with the definition of re-engagement followed by an introduction to two of our national partners who will tell us more about engagement and re-engagement during this unusual school year. Then we're going to hear from two communities who have been addressing student re-engagement prior to and during the pandemic, including hearing from two young people from those communities. We'll close our conversation out with a moderated question and answer period. As we move throughout this conversation, please submit your questions in the Q&A box. So to start, I wanted to briefly introduce the Grad Nation campaign at America's Promise. Grad Nation is a decade long national campaign to increase the high school graduation rate to 90% and to improve the high school experience so that upon graduation, young people are ready for whatever their futures hold. Our campaign is over a decade old and in this time we have developed a deeply held belief in the power of uplifting community led efforts to support young people to the gateway milestone of graduating from high school. Several years ago, the Grad Nation campaign with the support of AT&T released the Action Platform. The Action Platform identifies six areas of strategies that when implemented together can improve graduation rates. These six platform areas are based on the collective experience and expertise of individuals at organizations engaged with young people across the country, the experience of young people themselves and our own research. The areas of the Action Platform are using high quality data to inform approaches, responding to the non-academic factors that Im impact a student's life, improving school climate and culture, strengthening caring adult relationships, providing pathways to post-secondary opportunities, and finally, re-engaging young people who have left school without graduating. We're here today to discuss re-engagement, which is a community-driven strategy that starts by identifying young people who have left school or who have been disengaged and then continues by providing support to help those young people to re-enroll or re-engage in courses so that they can graduate with a high school diploma. This is a critical strategy, especially during a year of remote learning or hybrid learning and rapidly changing learning environments around us. It's critical because students leave school for all kinds of reasons, uncontrollable life events that happen outside of school, disconnections between academics and work, a lack of emotional, emotional and tangible supports that lead to a sense of disconnection. Effective re-engagement strategies help connect young people to the supports they need that will not only lead them to graduate, but will address their personalized needs. It's about breaking down the barriers to their long-term success. We wanted to note that the American Rescue Plan Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund has funding opportunities for education that cross a wide range of needs. Funds can be applied to support improvements to physical safety, increasing content experts and expertise, hiring more school staff, funding out of school enrichment opportunities, addressing the digital divide. Throughout today's conversation, we're hoping to shed light on ways you can use these funding opportunities to strengthen re-engagement capacity in your community. So we're going to talk about re-engagement more deeply in a minute, but first we need to start with some context setting about this year. Many practitioners and educators are thinking about engagement and attendance differently in a virtual or hybrid environment. We know that re-engagement hones in on the concept of losing a school connection, 
But in COVID-19, how have we changed our understanding of what a school connection actually is? When you're logging into virtual classes and you lack the ability to do in-person relationship building, that changes the feeling of connection you have to your school. And schools might be struggling to understand how to measure student engagement, which leads us to a gap in knowing which students are really disconnected and which students are connected but struggling. So right now, I'm pleased to introduce Hetty Chang from Attendance Works. She's going to tell us a little bit more about the challenges associated with measuring attendance and engagement this year. Hetty is the executive director and president of Attendance Works, and she is a well-regarded expert about advancing student access by addressing chronic absence. Hetty, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and Attendance Works? Sure, thank you so much, Liz. So I'm calling in from San Francisco, California, but Attendance Works operates nationally. We really um, work at the local, state, and national level because we think um, change has to happen both bottom up and top down. We catalyze needed research, we nurture proven pr promising practices, we engage in effective communications, and we really look to advance better policy at all levels. And we have our this year's campaign, which is rebound with attendance, because we think this is such a key metric for informing the planning around COVID recovery. Um, so Liz, why don't I, could you go to the next slide? I can start talking to about the fact that one of the things we're seeing in um, using data is we actually have to expand the metrics of data that we're using. You can't just look at participation or attendance, um, which is how much kids are showing up and completing activities. We actually have to also look at whether we have contact and working contact information, because if you don't have working contact information, the kids aren't on your rolls, you can't reach them. You not need connectivity and access, and you also need um, really to make sure that you have relationships. And if you show the next slide, we see these as deeply connected. You know, if you lose contact with a kid, if they don't have connectivity or access, if they had chronic absence before COVID and now they're missing 10% or more, that all adds up to lost opportunities. And you need to also notice whether you have some relationship connection to those kids because it's through those relationships that we can then understand what's going on. Are they not connected in any way? Do we not, how would we even find them if we don't have the right information? How do we know, do we know whether they're experiencing challenges on connectivity or other kinds of barriers to attendance? Thank you for that overview of attendance works and this really interesting point about kind of our expanded understanding of metrics and identifying students. So we're wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about what trends you're noticing across districts this year to the extent to which they can actually measure engagement or attendance. Great. So let's go to the next slide. One of the things I think people have to understand is that COVID-19 has had a really challenging impact on our ability to measure and track attendance. So last March, when all schools closed down, most schools weren't even taking attendance. When we, you know, sort of, it, I think it's partly because everyone kept thinking, if we just wait another month or two, we'll be out of this crisis and the pandemic will be over. And now, you know, we're 18 months later. And so what happened was um, then by the time you, um, so before March 20, we used to have attendance taken every day. I knew attendance was, it was Liz, you showed up to class and I saw you were there. But now, Attendance isn't even necessarily required to be taken every day. And what attendance looks like can vary significantly from uh, two way, you know, it depends. Every state is defining it differently. And sometimes within states, they're giving incredible freedom and flexibility for the districts to define it. Sometimes it's meaning, oh, um, you have a two way connection, you texted someone. Sometimes it's a kid showed up on a virtual uh, class. Sometimes it's a submitted. Um, uh, uh, an assignment, it really varies tremendously. And another challenge we're seeing is that a lot of the data um, as you've moved to distance learning that is tracking whether kids are showing up, are they submitting assignments, are they uh, logging on to your quote learning management system is actually not where you keep attendance. So we don't have an easy way of making sure that teachers can take a look at their data to see where their kids are showing up and then put it into the data system. So then they get alerts 
when kids are missing too much school. We actually um, think and know that people still need to be tracking missing 10% or more of school, but we're really worried that that data is underestimating how much time and instruction in the classroom is actually being missed by kids. That said, if you go to the next slide, this is from Connecticut. Um, the next slide um, is from Connecticut, which um, as a state actually try to define attendance in a way that's more similar to um, what it was being defined before COVID, saying you have to show up to at least to four classes. You know, a two-way text doesn't do the trick to be considered in attendance in Connecticut. They've also paid a lot of attention to accurate data. And one of the things they've done differently is most states don't publish data on attendance until the following school year. It's like an autopsy. It's not like a diagnostic where you can see your trends. Connecticut decided to collect data monthly and then start reporting it. What we're seeing is extraordinary increases in chronic absence, almost doubling 12.2 to 21.4% kids who are English learners having high levels. And by the way, English learners before COVID used to show up even better than English speakers. But now you're seeing this incredible increase because of the challenges families face and getting their kids online and into these different settings when we don't haven't set it up for people who don't speak English very well. Kids with disabilities, kids who are living in poverty, um, not on this slide, but kids who are homeless, kids who are in foster care, extraordinarily high levels that we're starting to see. Sorry, thank you just for sharing that really incredible overview. And I think this data is really important and that sort of lack of what we know is becoming um, important to understand this here. And so I think this is really incredible data. I wanted to shout out to everyone in the chat. Yes, we'll be sharing these slides after. So you're welcome to take all of this valuable information in. But I wanna to shift to just wondering if you could talk to us a little bit, Hedy, about what are some things to keep in mind when tracking and measuring engagement this year and especially understanding what we just know about the lack of clarity and lack of data? So first of all, I still think we should be tracking monitoring 10%. If kids with all those different ways you can show up aren't showing up for 10% of the time, we know they're in trouble. If the data is that high, like we're seeing a doubling of chronic absence from maybe one out of six to one out of three kids. It means we have systemic challenges. So let me just back up for a second. When kids don't show up to school, it means positive conditions for learning aren't in place. This is true whether schools in person, at a distance or blended. So if kids don't show up to school, it means they may not feel physically or emotionally healthy or safe, right? They may not feel that sense of belonging, connection, support. They may not feel that sense of academic challenge and engagement or that they don't, they're not surrounded by adults or peers who support that. And so when you see high levels of chronic absence, we have to look at the systemic barriers. And by the way, this is both about connecting, so making sure every kid has a relationship, but then looking for patterns. Because if you have a systemic issue or a systemic barrier, like kids don't have connectivity or the kids, the, the safety measures aren't in place or there's huge bullying going on, it's not gonna be just one-on-one -on -one that you can, can change this. You're gonna have to think about how do you know which groups of kids? And if you know which groups of kids, like it is your ninth graders because they didn't feel connected to the school community, then you develop a ninth grade strategy or it's your older kids who are actually trying to balance work with family responsibilities and going to school. Then you might actually have to think about another kind of strategy. And it means we have to go to scale from not just one-on-one -on -one population, one-on-one -on -one case management to really looking at how do we know which groups of kids are having challenges and how do we organize our resources so we can support them and make sure they're in school so they have a real chance to succeed and thrive. Thank you so much for that, Hedy. I do just want to underscore this importance of relationships. We did a webinar earlier this month about relationships and we're seeing that they're increasingly more important in helping students get through this year. Um, this emphasis on relationships is just really key to understanding re-engagement. So now we are really gonna talk about re-engagement specifically. So I'm really pleased to introduce our colleagues. 
Um, our first two coming up will be Jocelyn Kosaiko and Antonia Ronhill Carell, who are from the National League of Cities and the Institute for Youth, Education, and Family. Antonia and Jocelyn are two core partners to the Grad Nation campaign, and we're going to talk to them about their work with the COVID-19 reengagement project and generally their stance on reengagement. So hi, Jocelyn and Antonia. Over the last year, students across the country have been impacted by the pandemic in various ways. In March of 2020, as schools closed their doors to mitigate the spread of COVID-19, many transitioned to virtual and remote learning. Based on the National League of Cities ongoing initiative, what do we know about student engagement and re-engagement amid the pandemic? Thank you so much, Liz, and thank you to Grad Nation and Attendance Works for being some of the partners working with the National League of Cities to undertake this effort. I echo much of what Hetty has shared about the need for greater investments for data systems that can monitor attendance. I would even go as far as saying that we need shared data systems between the schools and trusted community partners, much like those that after school networks have built. Having these systems can help communities better assess and determine much needed interventions. And much of what we are discussing today is different than our typical understanding of re-engagement. Between March and August of 2020, as Hetty mentioned, with the rapid transitions to remote learning, there was very limited reporting of attendance and student engagement as a whole. So as a result of that, the National League of Cities in partnership with the Coalition for Community Schools, which is housed within the Institute for Educational Leadership and other national organizations, we organized a nationwide peer learning community of municipal, local practitioners, and district leaders, as well as parents and youth from various communities across the country that represent a range of demographics, geography, school funding, and impacts and responses to the pandemic. Through these efforts, we sought to understand more about the crisis that was unfolding and to provide a venue for collaboration and to share resources and strategies. When we started to tease out the discussions around student engagement during the pandemic, particularly for middle and high school youth, a spectrum of connection and engagement emerged. So while we know that even before the pandemic, formal systems had struggled to address the learning and developmental needs of students, the unprecedented school closures highlighted some of the conditions and pre-existing inequities that made it difficult for students to continue connecting, as well as opportunities for positive engagement. So for the purposes for today, connected here means having an established link or relationship with a formal learning center setting, whether that be face-to-face -face or through an online learning platform. Engage here means having an authentic participation and or involvement in an organization or activity. To kind of give us a sense as to what this looks like, I want to share a couple of examples of some of the students we had a chance to speak with over the last couple of months. So let's say, for example, student one did not have broadband in their house at the start of the pandemic and could not connect to school during the first 12 weeks of remote learning. But through their school, they got a hotspot and a laptop. So this student was connected. Although they are now connected, though, they log into class but are not necessarily engaging. And this may be for a variety of different reasons, including relevance to their place in life, anxiety and participation, ambiguity of the future, or not feeling that the lesson is challenging. So while this student was connected, they were not necessarily engaging. Student two, as a result of the pandemic, their family had to move to a new town. They were not able to stay connected with their new school because they had taken on a job opportunity to help make ends meet. However, they were engaging with their city's re-engagement center who offers programs that they find enjoyable, such as financial literacy classes and a live Twitch session in the evenings of the game called Among Us. Liz, could you click on the screen? There we go. Um, then, so this student was not connected, but they were on the, spec on the other end of the spectrum of engagement. When we, so student three now, since the start of the pandemic, their school counselor has ran through their list of contacts and emergency contacts by phone and in person, but has not been able to make any contact with the student or their family. So this student is not connected and the school is unsure if the student is even engaging. So they are on the other end of the spectrum with not connected and not engaged. Student four has been participating in their school's remote learning since the start of the pandemic without any challenges. They would even say they've enjoyed parts of their teachers, parts of the curriculum which their teachers have made a way to find, to make enjoyable and interactive. But because their parents are essential workers, they have been participating in one of their community centers through their city's community learning hub where they do their remote learning coursework and then activities led by after school practitioners. So they are, they are both connected and engaged. So while we don't know the nationwide scale of how many students are connected or engaged, there is a sweet spot here, connect, being both connected and engaged. And this is where we're trying to get students closer to, closer to the sweet spot where they are connected and engaged. 
thank you for that really powerful overview. Um, just wanted to flag a couple of people are noting that you're difficult to hear. So you might want to be a little bit louder when I ask this next question, which is early forecasts tell us that some students could return to school an entire year behind, which threatens to widen inequities, particularly for students of color, students with disabilities, and students from low income families. What are some strategies that they can consider to reconnect and re engage students? We need to really listen to youth and they have made it very clear that they are not a monolith and that they are all at various parts of the spectrum and that the strategies to reconnect and re-engage students should reflect that. So while the, those in the best position to determine these strategies are the experts working at the local level who have a better understanding of their youth's needs, community assets and context and culture, we believe that there are three levers to addressing reconnection and re-engagement amid the pandemic. First, standing up efforts to conduct direct outreach of students that are not connected to first and foremost assess their well being and address their basic needs and securities, such as food, housing, broadband, transportation, health, and mental wellness, are critical, and to establish a line of communication. Second, should be a su supports and services that address unfinished learning. As you mentioned, students may return to school an entire year behind. And third, creating opportunities for positive youth engagement that can address the social and emotional needs of students, with two and three happening in tandem. So outreach can be conducted in a variety of different ways, including peer to peer, um, much like there was a student in Santa Monica who is a junior in high school and created a school club to virtually connect and check in with her classmates with disabilities. And throughout the conversation today, you'll hear more examples of some direct outreach on today's panel. So once you've established that link and students are connected, it's critical that communities have supports and services set up to address unfinished learning and positive youth engagement which for middle school students can take a variety of forms such as targeted intensive tutoring and through expanded learning time. When it comes to intensive tutoring, our partners at the Education Trust have put together an amazing, amazing couple of briefs, which we'll add to the chat that you can look through for some tips and tricks on how to stand up intensive tutoring programs. When we think about digital skills training, we know that youth in the 21st century need to be prepared to have these skills. So regardless of whether or not we continue to have the pandemic, we need to be sure that students are digitally literate. As well as thinking about career and technical education. As I mentioned earlier, youth are very unsure about what their future holds. Um, so providing alternative credentialing as well as greater career and technical education, such as those in the green economy can help youth, especially those who have left school to take on employment, to be connected with a formal learning setting to graduate. And when we think about positive youth engagement, this is going to be really critical and again should be happening in tandem with number two. Weaving in enrichment programs to expand the learning can create opportunities for students to engage just for fun, to explore college and career opportunities, and to feel like they belong and are a part of something. Middle and high school students need tailored supports and services that are different than those offered to pre-K to five students, ones that recognize their needs as, as people who are stepping into finding their agency exploring socialization and developing their interests. Our partners at the After School Alliance have put together great resources for leveraging after school and summer learning programs to do justice. But I would, I, would say, I would end by saying that research tells us there are small margins of improvement with old drill and kill methods of summer school. So as we look towards summer, we need to be thinking about using summer wisely. Thank you for that. And I think your point about using summer wisely is really key. So just wanted to add now that on March 11th, President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan Act, allocating $122 billion to education, along with other funding. What should communities consider as they think about the allocation and implementation of the funding that they are receiving? We really have to get real with ourselves and acknowledge that our education system's underlying problems long predate COVID-19. And to be able to get more students to be connected and engaged into that sweet spot we talked about earlier, we need individually responsive and adaptable supports and services. And our educators, despite their invaluable and even heroic role, need partners. We cannot go back to business as usual. So what would it look like to build a strong learning and developmental ecosystem that leverages our existing assets and partnerships, one that's equipped to expand children's opportunities, meet their interests and needs, and offer diverse pathways? Shortly on today's panel, you'll hear from a community that's been doing this since 2003 and has been making the community a learning hub, but I'll let them share more about how they fared throughout the pandemic. Um, but really, I, I wanna 
but this is this is great and then nearly every community contains the, the great thing about this is that nearly every community contains the components of a community learning hub and we've seen amid the pandemic upwards of 370 communities use community centers and vacant property to stand up learning facilities so there are opportunities to establish and transform our communities through the american rescue plan act into full service community schools that offer coordinated wraparound services and through the American Rescue Plan Act, there's never been a better time to build towards to build towards that while responding to the immediate needs of families, businesses, and education. And without sounding too hyperbole, I this is a really historic moment. Uh, it's a one in a generation opportunity. I won't go into a lot of the all of the details of the American Rescue Plan Act, but I do want to call out a couple of specific things, and that is that there are specific dollars going to cities that can be used to go to nonprofit organizations. And when it comes to thinking about partnerships, this is something to really consider here. The other thing is that there is $1 billion for the Corporation for National and Community Service through the AmeriCorps, through the AmeriCorps programs. And you'll hear a little bit later on about some of the ways that you can leverage your AmeriCorps programs as well. But there's, there's obviously a lot to digest here in terms of what is possible. Um, but can we go to the next slide? So as we as we think about how to finish, how to connect and what, what can come next, if you're a school education agency, consider connecting with your school, your state's after school network and other statewide after school providers. Well, there'll be a link in the chat box that directs you to find your statewide after school network if you're not connected with them already. Please connect with your municipalities and counties, particularly your municipalities. They are already thinking about how they can leverage their funding. So make those connections too. Call in your local partners, like community-based organizations who have been, who have those strong relationships with their community, particularly after school and summer learning providers. But if you're not on an education, a state education agency, and you're on the line today, reach out to them and figure out how they're thinking about using that funding. Offer your partnership to superintendents, school boards, and principals by sharing examples and evidence, and demonstrate your existing connections with students and families, especially those in low-income communities. The two last things I will say is that the National League of Cities will be conducting American Rescue Plan calls every week, every Friday at 1.30 p.m. to kind of give a digest of how these dollars can be and are being used. And if you have your own stories that you'd like to share about how you're using the American Rescue Plan dollars, please go ahead and use the barcode on the screen to share those with us. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce my colleague Antonia, who will introduce today's panelists who are a part of the National League of Cities Student Reengagement and the COVID-19 initiative. Yeah, thank you, Jessleen, for that overview. Um, we have an incredible panel today with two communities who have different climates but share something in common. They're both working to connect and engage youth in their community. First, you'll hear from Colorado Youth for a Change, whose strong partnerships with schools and the use of national service programs, such as AmeriCorps, has helped them connect and engage youth amid the pandemic. Then we'll hear from the city of Orlando, Florida's Paramore Kids Zone, and learn how their exceptional preventative measures and community partnerships have helped them have helped them fare through the pandemic. And uh, we'll also be joined by students today. So um, first up is Mary Zanotti, the CEO of Colorado Youth for Change. Thank you so much, Antonia. And thank you everyone for having us here today. We're really excited to share our experience with you. Um, Colorado Youth for Change has been partnering with schools and districts to provide dropout prevention and re-engagement programs since 2005. In 2015, we began to use national service, AmeriCorps, as a way to increase our impact. We currently partner with 17 school districts to provide early literacy interventions through our Colorado Reading Corps program, high school student engagement support through our Corps for a Change program, and student re-engagement through our re-engagement program. In the fall, we were able to utilize CARES Act funds coming from several different cities as a way to help fund our re-engagement and engagement efforts. In addition, we are able to utilize COVID relief dollars available through our governor's office to support an expansion in programming that included reaching out to students and families across K-12 who are having trouble engaging in the remote school landscape. Next slide. Some trends we're currently seeing in our re-engagement uh, work is that students we're finding are needing to work to help support their families during this time. 
uh, students have a desire to re return to school when it's consistently going to be in person. And the hybrid back and forth has been really difficult for students. Um, there hasn't been enough support for navigation of multiple platforms that schools are using across districts. Different schools uh, within a district are using multiple platforms. We're finding students uh, are feeling socially isolated. And you know, as highlighted by both Jasleen and Hetty, students are missing and the data doesn't paint the full picture. Next slide. In this slide, you'll see, we're seeing a significant decline in the number of students actually being coded as having withdrawn or dropped out from school. For good reason, schools are giving a lot more leeway right now. Um, you'll see in this slide, the historically the 17, 18, 18, 19 school year data represents the typical flow of students coded as having dropped out each year. This includes predictable spikes in late September, early October. For Colorado, we have a single count day, which is in October, so we typically see a spike there. And then again in early April after spring break. You can see in the 1920 lines a significant drop off in March, just when schools moved to remote learning. And as of today, we've seen a 23% decrease in student, students having left during the 2021 school year when compared to the last three years. Do we really believe that there's less students disengaging this year? You know, we anticipate that a large number of students are being coded or will be coded all at once this summer and fall. And by then it'll be even more difficult to find those students. And the data does not support the urgency that is needed to do the work to find these students. Yeah, thank you, Mary, for touching base on some of the trends you're seeing. Um, definitely something that we should all be taking seriously. Um, and James and Elena, from also from Colorado Youth for Change, will be answering some questions that we put together, um, kind of discussing their experience throughout this past year. Um, before we get into the questions, would y'all like to introduce yourselves? Thanks, Antonia. Um, I'm going to step in first, and then James, if you want to introduce yourself afterwards. Um, so yeah, my name is Elena Shaw, and I'm the program manager for Colorado Youth for a Change's Core for a Change AmeriCorps program. Uh, and so just a little bit of background on what our AmeriCorps program does. So uh, each of our AmeriCorps members has a caseload of 20 to 40 high school students, and our members support them to engage after they've left school or encourage them um, to be more engaged um, while they're still enrolled but have disconnected or, or are disengaged. So members typically serve at one school, but some members support districts at the support students at the district level and serve in multiple schools. Uh, so much of our support is focused on addressing barriers to student engagement, uh, such as the many barriers that folks have already talked about, um, students uh, having fallen behind in earlier years of their education, transportation challenges, lack of positive youth relationships, having to work to support their family. And obviously, as we've named, COVID has exacerbated these barriers for students in a lot of instances. So I'll turn it over to James. Um, and James is one of our amazing Core for Change members serving with our program this year. Thanks, Elena. Yeah, like Elena said, um, I'm serving with AmeriCorps Colorado Youth for a Change. I'm serving um, through Jefferson County's uh, Student Engagement Office. Um, so we do dropout prevention and re-engagement. Thank y'all for joining us today. Um, and can you all set the community content context for us? Um, are students engaging or disengaging? Yeah, so um, overall, um, students are disengaging. I mean, under the current circumstances, I mean, it makes sense. Um, students, the students that I support have struggled with creating a healthy and consistent schedule to engage virtually. Um, and since I support students who haven't engaged in school most of the year, um, kind of what Hetty touched on earlier, um, I've noticed how important it is for students to have that positive relationship with someone that will consistently, you know, check in with them, talk with them, strategize and, and just help them adjust to remote learning. Um, through remote lear learning, um, it is simply easier to disengage, I think, um, because of the amount of distractions at home. 
Um, the access accessibility to Wi-Fi isn't as reliable as it would be at school, or it is just difficult for them to find the motivation to get out of bed and log into their classes. And I think it's something that all of us are feeling right now. Um, but I also have found that a big part of getting students re-engaged uh, in class has to do with um, making sure they have all the res resources at home and uh, to attend each class. And along with that, keeping teachers in tune with effective ways to communicate with the students that are struggling with remote learning. Um, I do want to end uh, this question with uh, just saying how proud I am of each student that I've supported um, on putting their effort in to turn things around when it's not, I mean, right now it's really not easy to do that. Thanks for naming that, James. Um, and I would just add that, like Mary mentioned, our, our organization works with 17 different school districts. So as you can imagine, student engagement throughout COVID has been varied um, depending on the community that those students are going to school in and, and living in. And so it definitely does seem like some students have been able to thrive in the remote learning environment um, because you know challenges that existed before around transportation or social anxiety, those aren't as much of an issue. Um, and I think we've seen that with uh, uh, seeing some, some statistics around close to 20% of families um, wanting some sort of virtual learning option moving forward. And so, you know, clearly that, that virtual piece is working for some families. Um, and on the flip side, uh, many other students who are learning remotely don't have the communication, self-advocacy skills um, needed to stay engaged with their teachers. And um, of course there are other barriers as well, but speaking to that particular piece, um, we've uh, seen a component of students beginning to engage more once they're used to their uh, remote or hybrid schedule. Um, but when that schedule shifts, students begin to disengage again. Um, so I know Mary touched on that before, but these unpredictable transitions have been hard on both students and families. And I think it makes it hard for our, our system to be consistent, uh, which we know uh, helps in supporting students and families who've experienced trauma uh, when we want, when we are trauma informed with our families and students were more successful and uh, we know that consistency matters. So the, the whiplash for lack of a better word of, of moving from in-person to hybrid to, to fully virtual has been definitely difficult. Yeah, definitely a big task. Um, and what have y'all, what strategies have y'all used to um, help students re-engage during this time? Yeah, so I'll start with this. Um, since I was placed in the student engagement office of Jefferson County, um, I adapted a little bit to how they uh, process re-engaging students. So um, through this office, uh, we start by um, school counselors and social workers will submit a referral to our office um, when they have exhausted all efforts to engage uh, a certain student. Um, sometimes the re referrals come from a capacity issue or as just another option to get um, a new face and uh, someone else to that can connect with the student better than um, what has been used. Um, um, so to, to start the process of re-engaging students, the first strategy we use in our office is family out outreach. Um, I call, email, text parents of the students uh, first to get some background information. Um, and I've found this really crucial to um, being able to support students um, because parents know their kids best. They know what works, they know what doesn't work, and they know why that they're disengaged. Um, so once I have contact with the family, uh, whatever guardian um, it answers their phone, honestly, um, uh, I like I get the students' contact information. Um, once that happens, uh, I consistently introduce myself. I try to do that in a casual way. I think. Um, it helps students um, become a little bit more comfortable with opening up when they see, you know, uh, either my face in person or, or through Zoom, and it's a young face that, you know, I can barely grow facial hair. I mean, and I think that helps with, with kids. I think they need a young face a young and young people to support uh, them with anything. Um, and so, in the first couple of meetings that I have with students, um, it's mainly built on, you know, building that rapport, building that trust to be able to get past those barriers that they, that each individual has. Um, and all, all the individuals have different things that they're going through. Um, so I try to make it known that um, 
right from the beginning, um, the, whether it's in person or through Zoom, uh, they have a, a safe space to, you know, open up about uh, their struggles, their personal struggles, their struggles with school. Um, because a lot of times that those struggles, those personal struggles and talking about those things um, are a lot, are just as impactful as using strategies for uh, re-engagement. Um, but after the first couple of uh, meetings, uh, a lot of times um, communicating with teachers, counselors, social workers, and everything like that for the student um, is required uh, just because some students, especially right now, um, lack the, their own self-advocacy uh, to kind of get started with getting back in class. Um, but like I said earlier, sometimes school is the least of their worries and, and, and just talking about something that they're going through um, or they're really struggling with is, is big and I like to keep that space. Um, and speaking on personal struggles and mental health, um, that's something I'll always advocate for my students and that is never gonna change. Um, but also an effective strategy that I use to re-engage students is I create a, um, a grade spreadsheet uh, from their infinite campus, which is where they keep their grades. And I make it uh, uh, two extra columns where it says turned in or not turned in. It's very obvious. Um, and we go in each time we meet each week and we submit uh, a certain assignment to turned in. And then we move on to the next one, kind of just to take everything day by day, assignment by assignment. Thanks, James. Yeah, I think uh, James has really figured out the um, the importance of authentic partnership with students, and that's paid off to say the least. Uh, so we're we're really grateful for for James, and I think in his his service in our program shows the power of AmeriCorps. Um, and I would also add that as a program, uh, we've really trained members to ensure that students understand that they're the experts on their own experiences, and we are simply here to support them. Um, so we really lean on motivational interviewing, positive youth development, and the idea of power with and not power over. Um, and again, James does these pieces really well. Um, and so members do this through working closely with students on identifying their needs. And one thing that James and I have talked about um, that is a strategy that works well is um, identi again, identifying the needs of the students and crafting emails together. Um, to their teachers and counselors on what support they need and then over time pulling back the intensity of, of this support in order to empower the student to advocate for their own needs and then of course over time this empowers students to have ownership over their own education and their own engagement in school and allows for more sustainable progress which um, is obviously important in in the context of AmeriCorps because oftentimes our our uh, our members are, are only in the schools for a year so it's a pretty short amount of time that folks are working with students. So the more uh, skill skill development and, and just sustainable solutions we can implement, the, the better. Yes, so many great, you know, um, strategies y'all have used. Um, how, how has your strategies changed during COVID? I mean, I would say that my strategies haven't changed, but um, the way I implement them have had to change because of COVID. Um, by this, I mean, you know, learning how to utilize Zoom for students to engage in what I'm presenting them and, you know, keeping my calendar open for individual meetings uh, just through Zoom. Um, it was a little bit difficult at the beginning of the year to adjust to the communicating with teachers and, and counselors remotely, like through email, um, because, I mean, when they, they see James Walsh from AmeriCorps um, is contacting me and they don't know who I am. Um, that was a little bit difficult, but for the most part, teachers and counselors have been quick to respond to anything because they see I'm, I'm here to support their student. And also um, my supervisor through the student engagement office, um, Jolie Mann, uh, has helped me integrate into all the schools very well. That is something that um, the office that I served through is very good and transparent with, which it has helped a lot, especially during COVID. Um, as I said earlier, I make it, um, it's hard. It's hard to communicate personal struggles and things through, especially through Zoom. It's already hard in person, um, even for adults. And so for, for students, I try, I, all I can focus on is the relationship I'm building with them. Um, and that doesn't change too much. It just changes um, through the type of platform I use. I'm just using Zoom. 
I'm going to treat you just like uh, you're in this space with me. Um, but uh, due to the difficulties that have arose during the pandemic, I like to uh, make it a priority to validate and congratulate the students for getting over their struggles and, and their, their successes as well. And I like to communicate that with um, their families, especially during COVID. Um, and I will always advocate for celebrating little wins. I think every educator support position, and that should never be have to be an adjust, adjustment because of COVID. I think everyone should celebrate little wins on, on a daily basis with students that are already engaged and students that are, are getting back engaged and who have struggled. Thank you, James. Yeah, and I think when we're when we're celebrating those little wins, it, it shows we're paying attention uh, as well and, and continues to help build that authentic relationship. Um, I think in other other ways that we've had to get creative in terms of how we're engaging students during COVID, um, we uh, all of our AmeriCorps members receive a, a cell phone through CYC, and so they're able to uh, text students, FaceTime students. We've done a lot of home visits. Um, and additionally, some of our members have made uh, interactive virtual classroom classrooms through Google. Uh, so they've made uh, little bit emojis and have their AmeriCorps shirt on and decorate the classrooms um, with different interactive activities around, you know, why does attendance matter? Um, you know, some self care activities. Um, and another big feat, another big piece um, is just sitting in on on remote learning classes. So in a traditional year and in person with in person learning, uh, oftentimes our AmeriCorps members are um, going into say they have four or five students on their caseload in one particular class. They'll go into that class and provide some um, just more uh, individualized support to students. And I think the teachers are often really grateful for that additional um, adult presence. So our, our members are doing that in a virtual context as well, just logging into the virtual classroom and you know their students see that they're in that class, they know what's going on with the curriculum. So if there's upcoming assignments, members really know what's going on. So that's been a really successful um, strategy as well. Thank you so much, um, James and Elena. Y'all shared so many great strategies and you're doing such great work. Um, we're gonna move on to the next section. Um, Matt will be joining us and I believe James will be introducing him. Yes, I will be. So I'm very, very proud to introduce um, Matt. He is a student that I have been um, working with throughout the year. Um, uh, his name is Matthew Rayburn um, and he, is he goes to a school in Jeffco. Um, and so we'll start, I'll ask you uh, the first question here, Matt. Um, so we've, we've met throughout the year and you've shared a lot with me a bit about what the years look like um, for school and everything like that. So um, for the people that don't know, what has your experience um, with school been like during the past year? Yeah, so um, this year's school experience has been pretty inconsistent. Um, as you know, I was falling behind on my credits and uh, you reached out to me over a month ago. Uh, one second. Uh, yeah, something that really helped me this year was uh, your ability to like identify the cause of re-engagement and really address everything around that. Um, a lot of things happened this year that really like slowed down my process of uh, like being engaged with school, as you know. And um, yeah, everything else has been pretty inconsistent, but uh, you've really helped me get it back on track. Yeah, I, I, I like that you mentioned that, you know, stuff outside of school um, can happen and, and that it's easy for you to slow down or someone to slow down when, when stuff is happening. Um, so even through that, um, I've noticed that you've, you've maintained a school connection and, and you did mention um, a, a couple of things that have helped you, but um, who helped you mainly uh, maintaining your school connection throughout this year? Uh, maintaining my school connection? Well, you were my school connection, but maintaining my school connection was really my mom, like uh, just being on my butt about like, um, like keeping up my calls with you and everything like that. And once I did really pick up on, on meeting with you consistently every week and stuff, my grades really did start to turn around. Um, like, and, and as I said, it's really, it's really, and like you said, it's really about like, um, like there's, there's a lot, 
more things to worry about with a lot of teenagers in school. And, um, and I, I feel like you, you, you speak from experience and somebody that can speak from experience can really like support and help those types of kids that um, have a lot of other stuff going on. Um, but as far as like maintaining a school connection, uh, my mom has definitely helped me do that. Yeah, that's, that's really good to hear that your mom is a good support for you. I think um, it shows how, how parents can, can really make an impact with uh, anyone re-engaging. I think that's huge. And, and I've been happy to uh, be, you know, serving with you. Um, I've really enjoyed meeting with you every single week. I think we've had really good conversations and I, and I do uh, appreciate your ability to be vulnerable with me. Um, and I, I'm glad I've been able to be vulnerable with you. I think that's, that's kind of part of it. Um, so I got one more question for you. Um, so we, you did talk about, you know, uh, meeting with me, helped you get back into school. Um, I just want to hear how you feel about, um, now that you're back and now that you're engaged, I just, I just kind of want to hear how you're feeling about, about everything. Well, like when you're, uh, when you go through months and months of like not trying and months and months of uh, just like not putting in effort and like not seeing the bigger picture and what like getting an education and participating in high school really is, um, you start to like kind of just be, be hopeless and stuff and like not understand the, the severity of and like having a diploma, you know, mm -hmm. and where that can really get you. Um, I feel like a lot of, sorry, what was your question? Just how you just explaining how you're feeling now that you are back. Oh right, right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it. I, I realized I I just thought a little too much about it and um, big picture, like it was really just um, doing work, a little bit of work every day, like consistently and actually um, participating in classes. And once you get in that routine, it's a lot easier to keep up with it. Yeah, yeah. I'm and I'm glad you're seeing that because I think um, sometimes it does take someone else to, to show you that you can do that. And I'm glad that I've been able to do that, but I don't want to take all the credit because I it's all something that you've been able to do. It's just now you see it. You know? yeah. So I appreciate you being here with me and kind of representing the work that, that I'm doing and the work that a lot of people are doing. And, and I, I'm glad that you are a face that can show a lot of kids that uh, have disengaged that they can do it and they have the ability to do it. So thank you, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Matt, for sharing your experience. Thank you, the Colorado for Youth for a Change team for just sharing everything that y'all are doing within your community. Great work. Um, next, we have Brenda March and Dr. Patricia Rita from Paramore Kids Zone in Orlando, Florida. Um, and we'll begin with Brenda March giving us a little background on who Paramore for Kids is. Good afternoon. The city of Orlando has been so fortunate to have a consistent mayoral leadership for almost two decades. Mayor Buddy Dyer has, was elected in 2003 and as part of his platform, he chose to make deep and critical investments in the Paramore community. So Mayor Dyer had a vision and saw the opportunity to strengthen supports and services for the community as a vehicle for addressing long-standing inequities, including poverty, low graduation rates, public safety, housing, among just a few. When Mayor Dyer took the stand in 2003, he asked the, his constituents to judge his administration by his commitment to Paramore. And this continues to be his mantra today. Over the past two decades, the Paramore community continues to flourish. Under Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer's leadership, we've been able to build an ecosystem that leverages and connects the assets of our entire community, including schools, museums, parks, libraries, and after-school programs. These have in turn helped us address the needs of children, youth, and families across the Paramore and Holden Heights communities. My colleague, Dr. Patricia, Patricia Rita, she serves as our PKZ academic coordinator, but she'll speak more to how our community fared during the pandemic, but assisted in having built this ecosystem that equipped us for what would be a year unlike any other. 
Thank you so much, uh, Brenda. Um, Dr. Rita, would you um, set the community context for us and are students engaged or disengaged in your community? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, when the pandemic struck early last year and the schools transitioned to all remote learning, the Paramore Kids Zone community was ready. Thanks to over two decades of investments, we were able to revamp, redirect, and redeploy our staff and resources. While yes, we had students who had never participated in remote learning ever and did not have Wi-Fi or broadband capacity at home to successfully complete the school year, for our longstanding partnership with the school district, we were able to provide students with devices, provide financial support for repairs and replacements, as well as provide transportation to and from their schools when the device distributions were taking place. Our partnership with the school district was invaluable in supporting our students. Once students received working devices, we were able to assist students with intensive tutoring and support, of course, following all COVID-19 protocols. Our youth practitioners and staff maintained contact with teachers and monitored the school district's data management system to make sure students were on track and completing assignments. <clears throat> Yet even after doing this, we still needed to find other ways to connect and engage with our students. Although all city facilities were closed to the public, city employees continued to operate. Our team did what they do best and went out into the community to provide Wi-Fi using our city devices as needed and to conduct wellness visits with our youth and their families. We knew that maintaining a connection would be important to keeping our students and their families engaged. With more information about COVID, we were able to conduct summer camps, but with smaller numbers of students. With the pandemic ongoing, we continued to tailor and assess programming to meet social distancing requirements. Summer 2020 taught us many lessons that we would need going into the 2021 school year. In mid-August, schools reopened and families were offered three options for the first semester. Students could attend face-to-face -face on campus. They could attend virtually either through the local virtual school system or via classroom through live streaming with teachers teaching, or they could attend using a hybrid model, some classes on campus, some classes virtually from home. The initial plan was for all students to return to campus and face-to-face -face instruction for the second semester. But in late December, the decision was made to allow students to remain with their current choice if desired for the remainder of the school year and allowed for students to change their modality each quarter. So we have seen an increase of students returning to campus each time the option is given to the parents. We continue to have the majority of our PKZ student caseload on campus participating in face-to-face -face instruction. However, most teachers are teaching both face-to-face -face and using live streaming. So students spend most of their day staring at a computer, socially distanced, wearing a mask as dictated by current guidelines and protocols. Remote learning has been a strain on families and students alike. We found that many were home with little supervision during the day and not logging in at all to complete their work. So we began collect conducting home visits when schools first shut down, continued throughout the summer and in the new school year. We also partnered with schools to determine who was not logging in, who was behind in classes, and who needed additional support. So when the schools reopened, we continued to monitor that progress and conduct home visits as we were not yet allowed on campus due to the COVID restrictions. <clears throat> Based on our high school population, around 80% of our students have been on campus all year. We currently have around 30 who are still doing, participating in remote learning for the rest of the school year. For many families, this has been a difficult decision. Our community has suffered many losses due to the pandemic and are less likely to have access to and take advantage of quality health care. Many have extended family or older generations who live with them who are at high risk due to chronic illness. We also have students who suffer from chronic illness as well. We support all decisions made by our families and support as best we can with the resources available. As the current school year ends, we are focused on promotion and graduation. We do not yet know what the guidelines will be for the new school year or for the programming, but we continue to partner with the school district and support our students and families, however necessary, to maintain, maintain stability and opportunities for student success. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, Y'all definitely do a lot of work within the Paramore community. Um, and what strategies have you used to help um, students re-engage? Well, uh, since the beginning of 2006, um, PKZ has been focused on building an ecosystem of support for the Paramore community. When the world shut down, 
and we were faced with numerous restrictions, new protocols and procedures, we pivoted, we had to. We revised and restructured our model to reflect the crisis and needs faced by our students and their families. We were briefly told <laughs> to work remotely from home. So we met students via FaceTime and Zoom. Our buildings were close to the public as we were those of our community and collaborative partners. So, you know, when the Boys and Girls closed down, we had New Image Youth Center closed down, a lot of the organizations they closed down, our collaborative partners, they couldn't operate. And uh, so we went into the neighborhood to conduct wellness visits and stage outside fitness activities, following all COVID-19 protocols. We worked with city consultants to create a wellness questionnaire for staff to collect data and determine the immediate needs of students and families that we served. Throughout the pandemic, we, we have used a wellness questionnaire to meet these basic needs by providing gift cards for food and gas and personal hygiene products. We partnered with the community organization to provide fresh vegetables, bus passes for transportation, assistance with applications for community programs, and most importantly, emotional support. We're, for, we're fortunate at Paramore Kids Zone because we have a licensed clinical social worker. And that position is called an intervention prevention coordinator. She's on, the social workers on site to develop, manage, and implement appropriate activities and share local resources and services available to our families. She partnered with the University of Central Florida to engage counseling interns to work with students, some virtually and some in person during summer camp to provide small group counseling and anger management sessions with PKZ youth. We purchased social emotional learning books, games and other materials to assist our team in meeting the vast needs of our population. We created uh, emotional social emotional learning kits to share with staff at other community centers and provided virtual training with the kit so that staff were prepared, prepared to support students at their centers too. So we didn't just do it just for our section, we prepared this for the entire city that had to work with children so that during this time, everyone would stay, you know, focused on helping our children succeed, especially when it came to social emotional learning. Our intervention prevention coordinator conducted home visits to check on families who were keeping children home for the summer to provide gift cards, educational materials, and emotional uh, social support, <laughs> journaling, and, and other, all types of fun activities. You know, they were reading books in front of their homes, in front of the, their homes inside of a chair and just like, you know, six feet apart, social distancing. And it was just so cute to see those little kids looking forward to staff coming out to um, provide those services and gift cards and stuff for them. We continue to partner with the University of Central Florida counseling interns who are on site daily to work with students during learning pods and after school programming to provide anger management as well as individual and small group counseling. For summer camp, we rotated staff and shifts so that those who were not with students on site could be out in the neighborhood conducting wellness visits, checking on family stability and addressing immediate needs. We continue to conduct weekly home visits for students who attend school virtually. We work with the city youth employment team to, to provide creative summer opportunities for our students. Many local organizations who would normally provide summer jobs were closed. So if they suffered layoffs or we just are not financially able to hire new staff. So the city of Orlando developed a clean team for students to earn some extra money, constructive activities and adult supervision. As schools reopened and families made their choices for instructional modality, we partnered with the school district to provide similar assistance as before. City of Orlando des designated seven neighborhood and community centers for learning pods for students who chose remote learning. We were allowed 18 students for a pod and provide a safe environment with adult supervision for K through 12th grade students. Again, we rotated the, the staff so that they could still conduct wellness visits and work with students on campus. We continue to partner with schools to track down students who are not following through with schoolwork. 
we invite those students to participate in learning pods and after school programming. Due to restrictions and new protocols, the school district banned all after school activities on campus. Therefore, we partnered with our recreation to develop a, an after school program at our site. So not only was our part of the House of Funded Families, Parks and Recreation, but we also included you know, Recreation, who is our, my colleague, so that our students would be involved in constructive activities during this time at our site. We provided a safe place with adult supervision that promotes healthy eating and physical activity for our students. We also provide field trips, experiences within COVID-19 guidelines during school breaks and days off to provide adult supervision again and novel experiences for our students. Dr. Rita. We continue to celebrate student achievement quarterly. Instead of providing a catered lunch and a celebration on each campus, we, we switched to completing goodie bags, making goodie bags for all of the students. We have a rubric that we follow based on their GPA or based on their grades. So instead of not doing that this year, we're still celebrating success. And instead of the, the meal, we provide the goodie bags either to the classroom for the student or we take them out to the home if they're on remote learning. For our high school graduation celebration last year, we provided an individually boxed meal to our 23 graduates who sat social distance in the gym on the bleachers and wore masks unless we were taking photos. We normally hold a large celebration with invited guests and family members and a catered meal, but we were restricted to a limited number and we made do. The restrictions did not prevent us from providing each graduate with a new laptop, a wireless mouse, a flash drive, a scientific calculator, and a dorm setup for those leaving the community for school. For our college graduates and scholarship recipients, we staged a drive through event. Again, we provided an individually boxed meal to our five graduates and three scholarship recipients, as well as a Visa gift card and a PKZ swag bag. And we sat outside under a tent in the parking lot and we took pictures of everybody and it was a great event. Well, that sounds amazing. And I'm sure they <laughs> loved it and really appreciated the work and the time y'all do for them, um, you know, the youth in the community. Um, and then for viewers listening at home who may not have an existing network or ecosystem like this that can quickly re-engage and reconnect students, um, what, would you, what would you say to them? Do you have like any advice or anything? Well, <laughs> We have had to move beyond our comfort zones and meet students and families where they are. We had to move away from tra traditional places. Our site or our school or just engage our students and families within the community to continue our focus on family stability, education, and student success. Next, we worked to strengthen relationships with our community and collaborative partners. Our actions during the pandemic have helped our local school administrators and teachers to acknowledge and appreciate the programs and services we provide to the families we share. In addition to the services we provide, we were, we were willing to partner and support the school by seeking out students who were not logging in and families who were not responding to messages uh, from the school and made space for those students in our program. Due to pandemic related restrictions, we use innovative and creative means to engage organizations to provide items our families and community really needed. The things that we take for granted during this time when the families were locked in. We request support and re recommended activities such as gift card, um, drive, clothing drive, personal hygiene gene drive and other fundraising ideas so that their employees could still support our mission and community by other means. In doing this, we were able to provide 100 students, each with a duffel bag containing four sports balls, 30 families with one month worth of diapers and wipes and 100 individuals or so with personal hygiene supplies because we got very creative and our partners came through for our families in the Paramore Holden Heights communities. Of course, our events were held outside <laughs> in a drive-through format to ensure safety for all and adherence to all local protocols and guidelines. The relationships with students and families are key. We have used appropriate social media outlets to remain in contact and keep students engaged 
We use FaceTime to contact students. We have PKZ Power Hour, a weekly virtual homework help, emotional support group, writing support, special guests, whatever and whoever we can bring in to provide support for students. Basically, creatively use what you have and be relentless. Finally, as we prepare to implement the PKZ model in three additional Orlando neighborhoods, it's in our city of Orlando budget. Thanks to funding provided by Mayor Buddy Dyer and the city of Orlando's commission, we are now able to provide economic, educational, mentorship, advocacy, and resources to help even more families in the city beautiful thrive during these challenging times and beyond. Thank you so much for sharing, um, Mrs. March. Um, Dr. Rita will now be introducing Theri. Oh yeah, Theri, who is there, um, which is a student who will be sharing their experience. Thierry Francois, our student representative is Thierry Francois. He's a senior at Jones High School and he's been vir working virtually for the whole school year. He's a very responsible young man and he's very involved with PKZ and he has his story to tell. So Thierry, are you with us? Yes. Good to see you, good to see you. All right, Thierry, can you tell us a little bit about what your experience has been like this year with school? Um, my experience with school during the past year has been really tough. Um, since March of 2020, when the pandemic hit and I was switched from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual learning. Um, virtual learning being my first time, the first couple of days were extremely inconsistent for me because I was at home learning. There was a lot of distractions. I was unable to focus in class. I was able to reach out to Paramore Kid Zones, my advisors at Paramore Kid Zones and the staff at Paramore, Paramore Kid Zones. And they were able to provide me in a room, like put me in a room without any distractions. So I was able to focus, focus um, on school. That's great. I'm so glad we were able to do that for you to give you fewer distractions. Have you been able to maintain any kind of a connection with your school this year since you've been working remotely? Yes, I, I have. Um, and Paramore Kids Zone has have been a huge factor of that. Um, there's there's times where I would email some of my teachers, and they and they haven't they probably have didn't receive them. And I would just reach out to Paramore Kids Zones, and they would go up to the school and talk to the teachers for me. So, yeah, I've been I've been able to maintain a, a good connection. Just so that everyone is aware, uh, everyone listening, we have what are called student advocates at the Paramore Kids Zone. Yes. So every student, regardless of their age, is assigned to an adult, yes. one of our staff members. And Theory, do you want to talk about your relationship with your advocate? Um, yes, I have a really strong relationship with my advocate. Um, Mr. Jerry's been my, um, ever since last year when I become a junior, Mr. Jerry's been my advocate. He's been making sure I'm on track, making sure my grades are up, making sure I'm showing up to class. He's just been really a big support for me. Mm -hmm. And he's helped you communicate with your teachers too, hasn't he? When they yes. haven't gotten your emails or responded? Yes, he has. That's great. So what are your plans for the future then? Um, my plans, I plan to attend um, a university in Florida. Um, I have gotten accepted to the University of North Florida. I'm currently waiting to see what FAMU um, says back to me. So I would really love to go to an HBCU and um yeah and, and I will be the first the first um child in my in my family generation to go to college that's amazing it gives me chills just thinking about that theory and I know that you're very you're ready to go to college and I know that you are just hoping the FAMU comes through for you yes. one more question how has PKZ how long have you been with PKZ and what are some other things that you have gained from being part of PKZ? Um, I've been a part of PKZ ever since I was nine or 10. And um, they've just been, they've just been around sometimes when I've, when I'm not able to, when my, I wouldn't say my parents are not like around when I'm not able to sometimes reach out to my parents, I would just reach out to Paramore Kid Zones or people at Paramore Kid Zones and it would just be like, um, it would just be ready to help me with whatever I need. And it's just, 
if I don't go home, like after school, I would just show up to um, the rec and just, it's, it's great. Okay, and what are you missing right now to be here with us? Wait, I, um, can you repeat the question? What are you missing right now to be here with us? Oh, I'm currently part of the program called um, the Black Bee Honey Program, a program that is helping youth like me to become entrepreneurs. And the program is also turning our community from a food desert to a food oasis. Basically, um, you have kids that wake up early in the morning and the first thing they would eat are like sweets. And we, we want to change that so they don't have to eat those type of things early in the morning. And what are you doing? How are you doing that? <clears throat> Um, every Saturday we go to the farmer's market and we sell honey. We bottle our own honey and we, we get the honey from North of Gainesville. Right now we currently, we're getting a, a hive on top of um, fire station one. Our honey will be more local. So we'll be able to provide more to our community. Well, thank you so much, Theory. I do appreciate you giving us your time today and we're going to turn it over to Liz for the remainder. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Theory, Dr. Rita, and Ms. Smart for that amazing presentation about the work in the Paramore Kids Zone in Florida. And also just a huge shout out to the team from Colorado for all the work that you shared as well. Um, we have about 10 minutes left for a Q&A portion. So we've been, we've been getting some questions sent in the chat um, or in the Q&A box throughout the you know, present presentation. And so what we're gonna do is just take a minute to stop the screen share and I'll start looking at questions and I'll just ask a member of the panel to answer the question. So I'm going to stop the share. Just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's presented so far. We think uh, the conversation that is left is really based on the questions that you have shared um, to us. And the first question that I'm going to ask is a blend of a lot of the questions we've gotten, which is about how to effectively engage parents in re-engaging their students. So a lot of times we've seen that a good relationship with a parent can really help a relationship with a student. So I'm going to actually ask uh, just Lean from the NLC to answer that kind of from a top level, if you've seen any strategies there, and then we can turn it over to Attendance Works to answer that question. And then if Colorado and Florida have anything to share, you can come after. Thanks, Liz, and thanks to our, our amazing panelists today. I think they really highlighted the importance of some of those relationships, relationship building, and the fact that it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. And I both of the panelists, the Colorado and Orlando, really showed us what that can look like. So I actually want to turn it to our, our panelists to kind of give us some of those strategies for, re for engaging families because they are the experts in how they're doing it in their local communities. So I'd like to toss it over to Dr. Dr. Rita or, or Ms. Marge, or as well as our Colorado folks for how to best use, do, that, do that engagement. Well, I can just start with saying that when Paramore Kids Zone was started, uh, we looked at the children because a lot of times the parents don't have the the knowledge of what their students need because maybe they didn't go off to college, maybe they didn't have the resources, and so what we had to do first is start with educating the children on you know there's a, a way that you can start. Uh, engaging in getting your education and just shifting priorities because a lot of times the students in the community want to do sports, you know. So, you know, if you get hurt playing sports, then what's going to happen to you when your body's not right or you get injured and your mind is a terrible thing to waste. So we started uh, ensuring that our students were safe and healthy and getting them where they needed to be. And in return, they will go home to their families and talk to their parents. And the parents will get excited about the stuff that the students were learning and, and doing. So uh, then that way we could, would be able to engage the parents that way. And then we also have what's called the Baby Institute, which is a partnership with the Early Learning Coalition. And with our Baby Institute uh, is modeled after the um, Baby College in Harlem. And just so you know, Paramore Kids Zone is modeled after the Harlem Children's Zone. And so with the baby college, there's a curriculum and in that curriculum, it teaches parents to be their child's first teacher. And so that um, the families go through this um, process where they learn how to reach to their child, the brain development, healthy eating and all that. So again, there's different phases for parent or kids on from cradle all the way up to the career. So I want to make sure we explain how we engage 
families in Paramore and they have opportunity to volunteer or participate and receive all type of services as well. Thank you for sharing that. The team from Colorado, do you wanna answer? You don't have to. Um, I was just going to jump in. I don't know, I saw James has his uh, camera on too. So if you have anything to add, James, but I think that we, through our intake process and process with our students that come through our engagement or re-engagement programs, we really do try to connect uh, with students' families, finding out, you know, what were the barriers for why they've left school to begin with? Why are they disengaging? How can we kind of get that wraparound support and help? not just with us and our staff and our program, but also with the families. And so definitely do our best to reach out to and try to engage as many families uh, in the process as possible. I can speak a little bit on that. Um, like I said, during the question part, um, I think it's that's when um, reaching out to parents at the beginning is very important because um, we have their contact information just right from the beginning and then they know that we're working with them um, so if if anything is communicated to me or their parents or anything like that or there is a struggle in engagement after maybe they did um, get back into school um, I have uh, conducted some parent counselor and then AmeriCorps member and student meetings in person. Um, we do those when um, there needs there needs to be something discussed, anything like that. I think that has been um, very effective uh, with the students that I've supported is just getting everyone that can possibly support them and getting them all in the same space in a safe way. I would just like to add one more piece around, uh, I know we've talked about celebrating student wins and, and validating students for their progress. But something we like to talk about within CYC is making sure to communicate with parents on the, the wins and the successes of students, not only on you know, when their grades are slipping or when attendance isn't looking so hot. So making sure to communicate um, you know, throughout the, the whole school year, of course that like initial introduction is so important, but communicating throughout the year when you know, maybe a student gets their their grade up to, to passing or, um, you know, depending on on that student and what their goals are, but communicating um, those those smaller wins can be really helpful too. And I just want to add to Elena that those that communication is so important. That's one of the things that with our advocates, they do call the parents and let them know positive things that are happening. And because we've been around for so long, parents, families know what we provide, so they can't wait to fill out that application and get their kids in our programming. We've had kids this year who filled out the application themselves and just had mom sign it because they want to be here. They want to be part of what we do. And we also, you know, with, with everything going on right now, many of our advocates have had to sit in on meetings with permission from families because families can't get there. So we are filling that role. And we had a young man tell one of our advocates this year that he was like the dad that he's never had. So we do keep that those lines of communication open with our families and we keep them informed as much as we can, but they're beating the door down most of the time to get here, get their application and get their children into our programs, regardless of how old they are. I would just add one more thing to jumping off of that uh, in terms of, um, Sometimes it's it's helpful, we've found to separate ourselves from school districts, not always, but when we call, uh, if, if there has been some historic distrust between a family and a school district or in a school, that if we say, you know, if, if, if someone's like, hey, I'm, I'm Elena Shaw, I'm calling with Colorado Youth for a Change, that there's sometimes just a different reaction from the family. Um, so that's not always the move, but something to think about when we think about individualizing our our outreach to, to families, that, that can sometimes be helpful. Liz, can Sorry, I? I thought I was, yeah, go for it. I was just gonna ask if you had something to add. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I wanna point out a couple things. One is that both um, Paramore and Colorado uh, Youth for a Change 
show how you really have to have a whole community approach, taking a tiered approach. That you got to start with a tier one that everyone gets. Everyone gets a positive. You don't just pick which kids. And ideally, you'd be doing that as kids are transitioning in so it feels normal. So often people feel like they get caught up, called because their kid's in trouble. And that is not a way to establish a positive relationship. You start by making sure everyone feels welcome, loved, cared for in your effort, in your program, in your school. And that means that it can't be just the role of a social worker or a truancy officer. It's something that everyone is trained to support. And then, and you can take advantage of those transition points. And I want to make sure people are thinking about, we had a couple transition points. Kids are going to be transitioning out of school into summer, and then they're going to be transitioning back into school. And that's when you both create the welcome, and then you look at your data to say, who needs more outreach? So that I can build on that, not do it instead of the tiered stuff, but expand the outreach and really target knowing which are the kids, which are the communities. Maybe it's a whole neighborhood that is less engaged. So you're going to have to do home visiting and knocking on doors in that neighborhood because those folks aren't even getting to those resources. And this is where I think we have to be strategic about the resources that we have. So we target the communities that are most left out so that the outreach is even deeper and more tailored to their realities, whether that's which region, which language you're speaking, um, which community groups are involved because they already are connected to families. And as Elena points out, sometimes people are connected to community groups or not schools because those community groups have their trust and not the school. And then you gotta figure out how do you build those bridges. Hedy, I'm so glad you answered that because you were going to be the person that I asked the next question to, which I think you've answered a little bit of, but we got a lot of questions about how do you engage in that deep re-engagement and how do you do that relationship when you have a capacity issue and you don't have a ton of staff or you are have a huge caseload. So just wondering from your work at Attendance Works and just thinking through like what you were just talking about, do you have any ideas for the audience thinking through with limited capacity constraints, how to be strategic about your relationship and engagement building? So first of all, and again, this is exemplified by these two examples, um, you need a team. You don't do this work as a single entity or as a single person. You have to create a team. So you have to do two things. I think you both want to look at your data, see how many kids am I looking at and where, where they are. And then you want to map your resources so that you can figure out because Again, people are too limited in their resources. Maybe for like, for example, one of the best um, examples I've seen of high school, uh, in high school of re-engaging ninth graders is you get the seniors to be the ones being the peer supports reaching out to the ninth graders. <laughs> it has two generation approaches. You know, you imagine theory helping a ninth grader think about what are his or her options in life? And most ninth graders think it is beyond cool to be with a senior anyway. So you already got, and, and that's the value. But we so underestimate the power of young people actually to be doing some of this engagement, some of the support. And I also wanna say, I've even seen it where people have brought in parents. I know this is pre-COVID, but of a district that was in Rhode Island, they hired the parents as the organizers. The parents sat at the front of the school and when kids didn't show up, they would call the kids homes, but they all knew the kids. It was an incredibly effective, they went through confidentiality, did all these stuff, but you gotta really invest in community members who know the school community, who can support that kind of outreach rather than thinking this is always done by professionals with certain kinds of degrees. I think that's what makes us think it's just a few people instead of really engaging in a whole folks. And then the last thing I would say is how we build capacity and partner with teachers because they see kids every day. They see when kids are lit, lit, missing out, but so often we don't have a place where teachers with all the crazy stuff they're dealing with have a place where they can call and say, I need support. I see this kid's falling off. I don't have the bandwidth. Who can help me reach out to them? Thank you for that. I think relationships matter between students and also between teachers and other staff. 
Um, we are out of time today, so I wanted to just take a couple of minutes to say thank you to our panelists and presenters. You've all been amazing. Thank you specifically to Matt and Theory for taking time out of your day to tell us about your experiences. We are getting so many questions that we could not answer them. So if you could email the gradnation90 at americaspromise.org inbox, we put it in the chat for any follow-up questions. You're welcome to do so, and we will try to get back to you. Um, this will be recorded and we will share our slides publicly and there will be a follow-up email. So don't worry, you don't have to commit all of this to memory. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. It's been a really amazing conversation and have a great day.